they're doing, they know what they're talking about. They've got it all under control. The Bifruthna Small, in particular, is a Odin handling one such self-titled bracket. He's the Bifruthna Small is a giant. He's an example of an individual who lays claim to a heritage which is not his own, and who believes he knows enough to be counted among the wise. So he does like anybody does when they start building their ego. They gather together a room full of people that blow sunshine up each other's ass and tell each other how right they are. <laughs> they walk around, strut their stuff, they put people in their place with high-minded learning until one who is wisest reminds them that that's not their place. Um, that's the first perception you get of this, but as we go along through it, I think you begin to see that he's really laying a path for us as to how we might negotiate and move through these traps of our own being. The first thing we're going to do is identify what the ego is. Popular thought is that the ego is our perception of self. That's a that's hundred years old and it's wrong. That's Freud and Jung talking about all of these ideas and perceptions of who we really are. The problem with it is in today's world on social media, you can get 1,200 people to agree with you, but out of 7.2 billion, that really doesn't mean shit. But in social media, you get the same kind of emotional, biochemical response when you get a like on your post as you do as if you actually go out and do something. And it leads to this boosting of ego, and people begin to believe that they can ride above the rest on what they think alone. That's not necessarily the case. I've got a little video here, because my word really doesn't mean a lot. I mean, I have credentials from the largest, biggest, oldest organization in the country. <laughs> Let's listen to some true professionals in the field of psychology about what an ego really is. Ego is the worst confidence tracer we could ever think, we could ever imagine. Is you don't see it in a single way. It's not. It's, I am you. The problem is that the ego hides in the last place you could ever look within itself. It disguises its thoughts as your thoughts, its feelings as your feelings. You think it's you. People's need to protect their own egos and those of no value. They lie to you, steal you, kill you, do whatever it takes to maintain what we call ego. <coughs> People have no clue that they're in prison. They don't know that there is an ego. They don't know the distinction. Yeah, for it's a difficult for the mind to accept that there's some, something beyond itself, that there's something beyond uh, uh, a greater value of it and a greater capacity for discerning truth than itself. In religion, the ego manifests as the devil. And of course, no one realizes how smart the ego is because you created the devil so you could blame someone else. In creating uh, this imaginary external enemy, usually you should made a, a real enemy for ourselves. And that becomes a real danger to the ego, but that's also the ego's condition. There is no such thing as an external enemy, no matter what that voice in the head is telling you. All perception of an enemy is a projection of the ego as the enemy. In that sense, you could say that 100% of our external enemies are of our ego. Your greatest enemy is your own inner perception, it's your own ego. It's your own. The most amazing fact about all of that. I'm sure that all of you saw the MDs, the PhDs, the physicians, the researchers, the lecturers. All of these professional men that are very well educated in everything that they do, talking about this idea that there might be some other thing running around in our head that represents that constant tug of war between right and wrong, between the positive and the negative. It also goes to point out that when somebody talks about the devil made me do it, now you've got a scapegoat. And the entirety of Austin True tells us that it is no longer something outside of ourselves which helps us move forward in life, it is ourselves. The most amazing fact about all of that is that our Lord tells us of this state of being, or more accurately, it warns us of this state of mind and tales that are thousands of years old. Now, a lot of people are going to scoff at the idea that a Stone Age tribe might even have that insight into the state of mind, but wouldn't they? What member of the tribe is valuable if all he does is talk about how great he is and never produces anything? Who wants to be associated with someone whose primary goal is to engage in polite character assassination? instead of going out and killing the mammoth themselves. 
The majority of people who show up in pagan faiths are folks who are looking for some way to sidestep the very hard work of putting their lives back into the order they were meant to be in. The entirety of Eber's Feast, and what I wrote about it, is a culmination of that tale. We work hard, we gather all of these assembled divine beings and what they represent, our emotions, our loves, our thoughts, our greetings, our beliefs, and we create a table where they might all be welcomed in our own thought process, our own mind, and one individual comes along and tries to screw it up. Is that tale really that old? Or is there something new in that understanding of something very old? When you look at Goblecki Tepe, this 13,000, 12,000 year old monument, it is carved with amazing skill. It is built utilizing technologies we're going to have a hard time doing today. <laughs> the deeper you go, the bigger they get. They didn't start small and work their way up. Somehow, somewhere, someplace, there is an older, just as impressive structure where these people that built this learned how to do it. Where did that come from? So, in the same token that our architectural <coughs> engineering has moved forward through time with great gaps that we don't understand, it is entirely possible that the understanding of our thought process may also have traveled through time. The Valthusness Mall, the first thing Odin does when he decides to confront this threat to what he had in mind for asking them is to discuss it with the significant other. Now, what did he have in mind? When I say the threat to what he had in mind for asking Nimbla, when Odin, Billy, and Bay are on that far distant shore a long time ago, they give three gifts to individuals to ask Nimbla. And we'll get into exactly what they created. But this part right here is an interesting understanding of the opposing dynamic forces, the masculine and the feminine. Odin says, Counsel me, Frigg, for I long affair, and Vathruth near fame would find fit wisdom old with the giant wise. Myself, I would seek to match. So the first thing he does is ask her, all right, there's this jackass out here. I'm going to go compare which with him. What do you think about it? He asks the most important part of his being, his wife. The full incorporation of the divine into his being. His wife obviously says, I'd rather you stay here, where the gods together dwell. Amid all the giants and equal and might to bow through fear, none I know. She recognizes this guy's a threat. I'd rather you stay home. <laughs> Throughout the lay, Odin repeatedly reminds the questioner of who he is. When he goes to meet Vathruth, I can't pronounce your name, <laughs> the giant, he tells him, he says, he, said, he reminds him, he said, much I have fared, much I have found, much I have got from the gods. That's a pretty clear indication. This is an individual that has searched, that has found, that has realized his connection with the divine. The giant cannot see it for his own greatness, or at least what he believes to be his greatness. He does not have ears to hear what he's saying. This repeated phrase shows a decided respect for the gods. Much he has gotten from them, but he does not include the effort he has put into earning this knowledge. Much he has fared, much he has found. And while it may be a somewhat deceiving turn of words when one considers how he found the runes or the meat of inspiration through hard work and sacrifice, it seems to be very clear he objects to chieftains who lay claim to this knowledge without putting forth the effort to earn it. <laughs> Brig wishes him well. Safe may thou go, safe come again, and be safe the way. Father of men, let thy mind be keen in speech with the giant thou seekest. So, I always find that the power of the divine feminine is never really to be disregarded. And that is an important aspect of it. We also get a hint, and we'll go back to asking them, but we're going to get a hint of what Odin meant for people when he when he bestowed those gifts upon him, Odin really in vain. And it starts out right there. King Gilfi was a wise man and skilled in magic. He was much troubled that the Aesir people were so cunning that all things went according to their will. That is probably one of the most important statements concerning the Austria that you will find. He pondered whether this might proceed from their own nature or whether the divine powers which they worshipped might ordain such things. That right there is the split between also true and monotheism. They are written that proceeds from their own nature. It does not come from some divine being they worshiped that ordained such a thing. We have these gifts. This is an important clue. 
when Odin bestowed these gifts upon people, is this what he had in mind? That he was that we're supposed to rely upon some outside entity? I don't believe so. The origin of man. What happens when we must stretch the boundaries of our thought process like we just did? There's a risk, there's a risk for the perception of self. How do we handle that? Well, we learn new things. How often have we seen that put to an abrupt halt, the learning of new things? What happens when we stretch the boundaries of our imagination to accept this new input as Gilfi is now struggling to do? See, his response is one of a complicated collection of atoms doing what it can to handle this new input of what we might refer to as spiritual energy. He begins his research, just as we are now doing. Biologically speaking, it would seem that we adapt to new inputs of energy. In fact, all of life adapts and evolves to deal with new flows of energy across the world. We see them migrate to newer, fresher, greener pastures. Things go bad, we go somewhere else to find something better. Who is to say that our minds don't do the same thing when it comes to erecting new boundaries to hold the chaos at bay? Make no mistake, there are predators at the edge of our minds in this process, every bit as assuredly as there are at the edge of the herd in its migration. That predator we can safely call the ego. That is the thing that will keep us looking outside of this perception of self. You see, when we drift off a normal path, Everyone lives in a manner that they feel holds the chaos at the edge of their minds at bay. The risk to pain, the risk to a broken heart, the risk to the loss of a loved one, the risk to all of these ideas of who we are. We work in a way that has a wall to protect us from that. And that comes from our faith and our understanding of how we interact with the divine. When that's challenged, and we're no longer as great as we think we are, Ego will bring it to an abrupt halt, much like Ali Al Ghazali did in the what 11th century when he wrote his treatise on how all of the learning of algebra and trigonometry and integers that were coming out of the Muslim world in Babylon and higher math were put to a stop when he said that is against Allah's will. Right then and there, <laughs> he probably couldn't add two plus two. But he could certainly write something that says, you can't trust in that math because it goes against what I believe, something out here that makes me feel like I'm great. It comes to an abrupt halt, and it happens all of the time. And this, it goes against, flies in the very face of when Odin, Billy, and Bay said, here's some gifts, go be great, join us at the table. <laughs> what are the original gifts? <laughs> From the prose edit, it says, When the sons of war were walking along the sea strand, they found two trees, took up the trees, and shaped men of them. The first gave them spirit and life, the second wit and feeling, the third form, speech, hearing, and sight. <laughs> they gave them clothing and names. The male was called Asker and the female Ember. From the poetic end of the balloons, but then from the throng did three come forth, from the home of the gods. The mighty and gracious, two without fate on the land, and they found Ask and Ember, empty of might. Soul they had not, since they had not heat nor motion nor goodly hue. Soul gave Odin, sense gave Honair, heat gave Lothar, and goodly hue. Three powerful gifts. And even as we address the notion of the gift themselves, we find an amazing overlay of the gifts and the actual structure of our brain. The brain is an amazing organ which controls the functions of the body. It interprets the sensory input of the outside world, and it embodies the essence of the mind, spirit, and soul. The first gave them spirit and life, the second, wit and feeling. The third, form, speech, hearing, and sight. The three gifts and the three structures of the brain align in some fantastic ways. Perhaps it's coincidence, perhaps not. And there are plenty of mummified and ancient skulls which show evidence of brain surgery and healing. Hmm, it's a pickle. And when you further break it down into the various lobes of the brain, you become introduced to a dizzying array of interactions we are only beginning to understand. <laughs> the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, the cere cerebellum, the brain stem, the, the original, that handles all of our automatic thinking process, our heartbeat, our breathing. The temporal lobe, understanding, language, hearing. There's our wit. Here's our wit right here. Here's our sense and goodly hue. Here's our color. You can break that down any number of ways you want, but they will show up that way. So what we have is an amazing organ, which serves as the focal point for what we call the mind. One of the chief attributes of all the lore, and indeed is in reference in the Havamal, is that we'd be able to question the matter well. An ego cannot do that, for its primary purpose is always to preserve itself. 
So somewhere in here, some part of our brain deviates from this brain-mind relation into preserving what it thinks it is instead of what it really is. <coughs> Sorry, Matt. Sorry. So we come back to the challenge Ode readily accepts. It's a form of guidance and instruction. It's a reminder that even Odin may be on our side, though we may not appreciate the challenge, there is a path for us to be on. And I'm pretty sure, based on kind of what I've just talked about, that it does not mean we walk through the world thinking about how great we are. We've got to do something. Odin said when he goes to the hall, he says, Hail to the hall, am I come for thyself, I fain would see, and first could ask, if wise thou art, for giant all wisdom has won. Thou truth near spake, who is the man that speaks to me? Calls him a man. Here in my lofty hall. See what I've built. It's great. And I'm sure that when you say something like that to Odin, who actually built everything, that he's impressed by it. But he says it anyway, so he doesn't know who he's dealing with. Fourth more dwelling, never shalt thou fare unless wiser than I thou art. So right there on this introduction, <coughs> we've got an individual who has seemingly built for himself all the worldly success someone would wish. The giants always represent the base, emotionist, emotion-driven, passionate, ego-driven kind of ideal, the simple, heart-driven individual. Odin is always the high-minded concepts of moving forward through sacrifice. And he's come face to face with an individual who doesn't understand that. He thinks he is above the rest. He's gathered a group of people together to blow smoke up his ass. He's built a great hall. Now he's willing to risk his head against someone he doesn't know because he thinks he's smarter than everybody else. <coughs> We've got to figure out how about dealing with those out of balance of personalities, ones which loudly proclaim but do not truly understand. Do they represent what we should be striving for? I mean, I guess I ought to spell check that shit. <laughs> 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 we are bombarded by these types of men in Austria on a daily basis. Indeed, all of paganism, we are bombarded by individuals who think because they've read some great old dusty wordy book, they have an understanding of what it really means. They think they can float above the rest on brain power alone. Men who show up as chieftains or goatees or some new and very special page dedicated to this or that organization. A safe space for heathens or roosters are justified and focused people to be proud of their attitude toward this faith and way of life. They fully expect people to honor their self-titled position, not knowing that there are countless heathens out in the world who, not, who do not respect at all the knowledge they believe they are in possession of. In fact, the rest of the world sit in that kind of snickering at us. So there's a little bit of a pressure here to say, what I'm doing is going to pay off in this world. What I'm doing is going to have some results for my, me and mine. <laughs> they abuse this knowledge by using it to justify their excesses of personality, or worse yet, to justify their emboldened righteous indignation based on their inflated egos. When Odin shows up at your doorstep, you don't talk about how great your hall is. See, there is no, absolutely no accountability for their words or actions on social media, and lots of people more than willing to jump on the bandwagon in order to boost their ego as well. It becomes a morass of personality. I have talked to countless people who take one look at what Austria means on the social media pages of Facebook, and they are, I don't want nothing to do with that. And they do the same thing with the Druids. They do the same thing in Wicca. They do the same thing in all of these alternative faiths. They take a look at it, they see the infighting, they see the bloated egos, and they're like, there's nothing here for me. And yet there are thousands, if not millions of us who thoroughly believe, and probably many, many more that want to hope that there is. <clears throat> Our job when we sit in these kind of rooms is to delve into the idea of how we make that a reality. All the while they are telling the world that this is also true or romantic or, or, or the Roman paganism or paganism as a whole or Wicca or whatever they want to call it. <laughs> and they're costing us dearly. Now, what would such an effort really look like to, to change that? One who attempts to gain understanding and knowledge. One who attempts to question and answer well. What's that really going to look like? We've got an example of that in the Lord as well. Come on, we kill you. 
I'm just playing, man. Hey, I'm bringing up. Got my cotton candy bag. Oh my gosh, whenever Stephanie posted that, guess which one? I'm like, oh no. Yeah, rainbow unicorn. That's what it's all about. It's two of those now, right? That's it, man. Here's a dream. Stephanie posted one that was like, it sounded like a manly, like. She got the purple wear pair of guava caps on. Yeah, and then there was another girly one. Rainbow unicorn. Yeah, rainbow unicorn. That was all about it. That was all about Good, man. Uh, Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Odin in this tale is a fine representation of what Osu might really be. He takes issue with the giant, a being who has always represented the basest of human emotions and thought processes. Uninspired human intellect and primitive emotional states of being. Now, here's another example of this, Alvis, and the Alvis model. Unlike the skilled dwarven craftsman Alvis, this great giant has not based his position on the skill of his work. Alvis made the assumption that through his work, the skill of his hands and the identification with his job, that this was the culmination of his being. Instead of working through the other issues of who he is, he figured he could just marry into a higher state of being. All of it shows up on Thor's doorstep. He's this skilled dwarven craftsman. He's got a good job. I'm going to go marry the nobleman's daughter. Thor's like, oh, really? Let's question and answer well. So they go through the same scenario. There's a question and answer scenario. Thor drags it out. Instead of becoming the the, uh, bully or the braggart or the tough guy that he's always uh, portrayed as, he uses his mind and he protects the integrity of his daughter from an individual who is not worthy to be her husband. Turns and the sun comes up and he turns to stone. <laughs> Similarly, we have Gerder and Scotty. Both endured great personal sacrifices to earn their seat at the table. Gerder gave up the comfort of her father's home to become wife to Frey. Scotty lost her father and accepted a certain bargain with the Aesir and she joined their ranks as well. Personal sacrifices. Alvis made no such effort. Vafruthnir has made no such effort either. He has contented himself with simply gathering around his fire beings of a similar stunted mindset and emotional state of being. And it is a standard response for individuals seeking to bolster and feed their ego. (laughs) There has never been a more efficient manner for individuals who are completely engulfed in their egoic thinking patterns to feed their egos. Social media is gas in that fire. For all intents and purposes, across thousands of years, he is a reflection of every upstart heathen who has decided to build an Austrian organization, a Wicca organization, or whatever, some kind of pagan get-together, and they always do it the same way. It's the typical us-against-them mentality. It's par for the course. The individuals who attend this effort are typically spiritually unconscious. There are people in their sleep. They attempt to reinforce how right they are by means of what they believe to be a superior intellect. They attempt to derive a sense of purpose and being by their association with someone they perceive as being more right than whoever they decide is their opponent. This madness has populated the timeline of history in a grotesque fashion. Hundreds of millions of people have perished from this very train of thought. One can see why Odin would be willing to apparently risk life and limb to defend that which he has put so much effort into creating, because that is by no stretch of the imagination an efficient or proper or beneficial use of the gifts we were given. What go? What effort goes into becoming something more? This is the awakening of Odin, and that's a particularly horrible picture. And yet we fail in mass to see the purpose of Odin's wandering and his sacrifice upon the tree. That sacrifice was of such magnitude that the universe itself brought forth the Norns to maintain balance in the cosmic hierarchy. A defense against the three all-powerful female Jotuns who entered Asgard during its golden age, hastening its end, but I digress. The awakening of Odin is done through pain and suffering. We all know the tale. For nine days and nights, pierced on this side, he hung on that windswept clear tree of woe. Hmm. None came forward to help slack his thirst. None was there to comfort, and when he fell shrieking, he fell into the essence of his being. Having crossed the boundaries of madness and ego to lift up the runes, and hear the songs of his ancestors. Sound familiar? It should. It's reminiscent of 70% of the stories of people I hear in Austria. When someone wants to join the Austrian Folk Assembly for a long time as a folk builder, 
I would get a message, this person wants to join, I would call them and I would discuss it with them and I would ask them, what brought you here? What do you want to be in this for? Why are you make this decision? And it would be something like that. They, the best thinking they had led to a life which sucked. Some of them imprisoned, others carrying the wounds of the battlefield, still others just dealing with the pain of life. Some were near ending their own lives, and then something happened. Something which allowed us a brief moment of clarity from the madness of this world to hear the songs of our ancestors and to find the runes. And while we may not have had the presence of mind to realize what happened, we had been afforded that glimpse of the divine which changes lives. I've said this for many years. No one shows up at the doors of any church. I don't care how you want to perceive it because everything is going hunky dory in their life. We have been blessed because we have been given a glimpse into the depth of our own being. The unimaginable presence of the energies which comprise our being had been hinted at. Furthermore, we had perhaps made a stunning realization that a small spark of those divine entities resided within our very being. No longer out here and unavailable, but right here and present. The unmitigated gall and arrogance that any being might lay claim to this knowledge by simply reading about it smacks of unparalleled egoic thinking. This flies in the face of the sacrifice made by Odin of his ego. What led him to this point is the Aesir Vanir War, where the Vanir came up and said, Well, should worship belong to all? Odin has built this great kingdom, the love of gold enters, he's got this wonderful Asgard. They're all sitting there saying, hey, we ought to get a part of it too just because we're here. He says, Odin has you all. He says, I'm not sharing anything. Throws a spear and loses the war. Uller sits on the throne. He goes wondering. He's got to find an answer as to why the very best thinking he could come up with cost him everything he ever held dear. His family, his loved ones, his wife, his kingdom, his castle, all of it gone. Because he decided to throw a spear instead of saying, all right, let's talk about it. This. Let's see how we can incorporate. Let's see how I can become better. Now you've got to go figure it out. He hangs on the tree, and just before the moment of death, like many of us, like myself, and many others, we find ourselves at the very bottom of the barrel, and life is at its toughest, and we have lost everything we hold. <laughs> there comes a moment when you got to make a decision. Do I continue living? Do I find some reason to go beyond my own thought process? Or do I go ahead and give up? And that's where he goes. And in that, 70% of the people I talked to said they had a dream or some idea that reminded them there might be something worth carrying on for. He finds the runes and the songs of his ancestors. Everyone that comes into this, we're learning about the runes and we're learning about the songs of our ancestors. We're beginning to hear and value the input of those people that have gone before us. <coughs> to fall back, stumbled by life, and find yourself in the arms of your ancestors, to hear their being minus the association we have with things. To set aside the constant pursuit, the hunger, to make ourselves seem more than we are by what we possess or simply how we think. And then to remember that there was once a king and a god who blessed our ancestors with divine gifts. What a truly remarkable thing to think that someone might try to lay claim to this divine awakening to boost his own ego. This is the reason they never succeed. They, like Vap Ruthner, come face to face with concepts, ideas, and powers they cannot comprehend. Their ego will not allow them to stretch their imagination and build new boundaries to learn new things. All it takes is one thought. The ego will put up a fight. It's not going to go quietly into that good night. At the feast, everyone bands together to support one another at Eager's Feast, and there he is. All of these great beings support one another. It creates confusion, chaos, which threatens the strength of the resolve of men. Such is our challenge in this new frontier of developing our minds into becoming something more. One thought. That's all it takes. And we are trained to have that one thought. From the time we're born, we're told the other shoe will drop. This is too good to be true. Now that can't happen. Why do you want to do that? We're trained from our parents, from our teachers, from our schools, from our churches, to have that one thought at the very moment when everything is going the way it's supposed to go. <laughs> I have seen numerous small organizations build steam and intensity by fostering that narrative of us, to, of us against them. Building that outside enemy, just like that doctor just talked about. 
projecting our own negative thoughts onto something or someone that, hey, I can be against that and I can be more than. Never once will they consider that there must be something more once they have these folks associated. The limits of the depth of their faith are clearly defined once someone says, hey, wait a minute, I'm not sure that's how they're supposed to work. And this is when the founder's worst fear is realized. That being that the association with the form of their thoughts giving them value as a person is not enough to create a spiritual experience for anyone. At this point, that person becomes a threat to the carefully crafted machinations of the ego. A crack in the facade begins to appear. The threat must be eliminated. And so many people who have come seeking to find answers to this glimpse of the divine they have seen run face first into the limitations of an unconscious man's ego. And it's one of the hardest things I have to watch. Any hope of spiritual development is stunted once the tiring effort of maintaining the righteous indignation required of these associations it brings them to the realization that this is how they ended up here to begin with. Staying mad at something, finding an enemy, someone to hate. That's how I got here to begin with. Why do I want to do it again with a new and different name? They are indulging in the same self-destructive and egoic thinking patterns and actions, albeit with a new name. Having been spoon-fed a new form of poisonous hate, they find themselves lost. Sure of the idea that this faith must work, but unsure how to set aside the ideas which have been the manner in which they value their being. The great fear of being less than they were, if they change their minds, puts the brake on the growth of this faith. And it is coming from men who seek to take full advantage of the fact that there is a knee-jerk reaction against dogma. Men who are terrified that the appearance of an ace of hope might once again lead them into a dead-letter religion like the one we just escaped from. For many years, we have seen religious people in possession of a set of thoughts which they regarded as an absolute truth. Being in possession of such belief, as their possession... <coughs> As their perception of absolute truth, they find more than sufficient reason to justify their actions against people they believe are wrong. Almost every time I see someone engaging in this type of thinking, I immediately recognize an ego desperately attempting to protect its identity. We see it in people who believe that book smarts allow them to be more heathens than others. We see the same mentality amongst folk who are vehemently argue against what they think might be racism. They have adopted a mindset based on thought being their reality. It doesn't matter if your thoughts are wrong. Their ego is in full swing and they will do anything to protect it. Ruin, they will ruin lives with the drop of a hat and feel fully justified in doing so. What kind of person doesn't recognize this as madness? One who is completely unconscious with regards to the patterns of their egoic thinking process. They believe they're right. You can tell I wrote that by the time I was in going to Kansas City. <laughs> there were a couple of professors up there when I went to do the presentation on Eager's Feast that uh, did not approve of my message. They went out of the way. I was on all three news channels, a couple of newspapers, live interviews, every radio station. All of them talking, he's a racist. He's a jackbooted thug. He's going to come up here and stir up hate. No, I just simply don't like you. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's what I digress. <laughs> Our greatest challenge is to unlearn old patterns and learn new ones. And that was an old pattern, but <laughs> this obstacle is one of the finest challenges we could ever enjoy. It's going to force us to dig deep and make that sacrifice, which will create an environment that people will want to be in. Isn't that part of the deal? Absent the, the hate for anything else. To take a look at ourselves and see if we have genuinely emulated or been forced to endure a trial such as Owen has in our own lives. We should sometimes ask ourselves, have I used these trials to build up a different narrative, boosting my ego as the victim? Because that seems to be the problem. Or have I accepted these things as pathways to finding and building a consciousness more in tune with what the gods had when they intended when, with all the gifts we have been given? The great folly of, I think, therefore I am, escapes these people. See, we are far more than the incessant background noise of our thoughts. We are the consciousness which knows that we are thinking energy which bridges the gap between the consciousness of being and the physical form of it. That association with the forms of our thoughts has created far more misery in our lives than we might imagine. It has placed us in situations which are eerily familiar to those in both of the legs, the small and the small. 
we may have bought in we may have bought into the idea that the form of these thoughts just like the things we own make us better or more important people isn't that what all advertising is supposed to do and that what society tells us own this own that watch tv it's called programming for a reason Aldous and Vafruthnir bought into that marking of their own thoughts and found themselves face to face with the divine and completely unaware of what they were dealing with. The various groups who have started or built their identities around opposition to anything are really in the same boat. The great crime is that they are leading any number of people astray and away from this divine form of growth. They become lost, they lose their heads, their faith fades in the fiery light of the sun, and usually when some great tragedy strikes them in their life. They have accepted these ideals which stack the deck against us. Our biggest challenge is to negotiate that problem. How do we separate the idea that these things that we own make us important or make us great? Now that's part of our ego. It tells us it's not important. Yet it is. <coughs> our minds were built to enjoy a connection to the divine. <coughs> These are actual brain cells, and these are the frequency in hertz. Several years ago, about 1987, I think it was, some researchers discovered that in animals there was a certain portion of the brains where neurons were always active. They weren't simply responding to stimuli. Our sights, touch, taste, smell, all that stuff activates these neurons. But there was a collection of them that are always working, always spinning, at about 60 hertz. Now, this is when the animal is moving through a maze using its whiskers to say there's a turn left here, turn right here. This is when it's using memory of that setup and its input to do it. The idea of passive input for us to understand the world is no longer considered to be a working model of the brain, and yet we still wonder if it is. It is that thing that keeps us wonder, working on the idea of expected phenomena to justify our faith. This right here something that's always going on. It's that inspiration. See, for the inhabitants of the ancient world to figure out the connection to the divine, to see all the wonderful thought, all, all the wonderful things in the world, to go beyond just thinking about wonderful things that actually went on a journey. Grand adventures across the sea or on horseback. Life and death were very real and experienced through all of the senses. How could one possibly experience it all? The origin of the myth of the Christ has its roots in that great question. And it goes back to Gilfie's question. Do these things emanate from them? Or is it because of the divine <coughs> it blesses them with? Them? The myth of the Christ consolidated that to one man so that everyone might focus their attention and their energy in one location. And thus began the building of the person's ego. He no longer went on an adventure to find great things began to think on something outside of himself and as the source of greatness and a great lie was forced upon humanity. Man began to look outward toward a central point instead of inward in his relation to the world. We became lost within our own minds, blind as it were, to what we were supposed to be experiencing. Not as beings experiencing the world through our senses, but something intended to be much more magnificent. The harvesting of those ensuing doubts not being able to experience the world, not understanding the inner workings of ourselves, focusing on something outside, building our ego, creates doubts. The harvesting of the resources we would willingly expend to rid ourselves of these doubts has gone on for thousands of years. We'll look at any great cathedral and you'll see when it comes to it. Look at the Pope's bedroom and the throne he sits on. It's a harvesting of the money from those doubts. This is not the original intended purpose for Old Billy and Bay. This is a part of that. There's an understanding that the energy that they had modified and harnessed would also change in the same way that they themselves had changed the environment. Entropy <coughs> is the idea that in the new book, Blind, there's a new theory come out from a professor at MIT that says when you shine a light on something long enough, the plant's going to grow. Right? Cells will accumulate in ever more complicated manners to disperse the energy that's being shined upon it to deal with it. We are the perfect example of a vehicle that can travel this world. 
our eyes can see in a certain spectrum of light, our bodies can handle the sun, we can sweat, we can do all of these things. And this is all a part of that. Odin, Vili, and Vey gave these beings that were accustomed to handle this earth of this world certain gifts to move through it. <laughs> so gifts were given to beings that either made or blessed, depending upon whom you asked, so that they might have a conduit for an unlimited viewing of every experience. And it fret and it spread. The two became many millions, and the abundance of the energy we now refer to as life. The bright and shining flow of self-motivating energy across the globe and around the world, experiencing millions and millions of different emotions in a billion different situations every instant of every day. What would it mean to Austin True if we begin to realize that those gifts of the far distant shores along the ancient sea of time are ours to enjoy today, readily accessible as conduits to the divine? Every single time a baby enters this world, this new bundle of joy, life, and unbridled energy, they are in receipt of those wonderful gifts. It is our actions which hinder them. It is the teachings of blind men listening to the whispers of another that blot out the sun in the lives of those most precious gifts. Sometimes it originates from their own parents, teaching them the ways of the world as they understand it, never once attempting to raise their head to reach for the stars and something more. Are they not born with the first gave them spirit and life, the second with in feeling, the third form speech, hearing, and sight, so that they might navigate the world? How come we don't all end up in the same place? We begin to think we're more important than we really are somewhere along the way, don't we? How do so many become so lost in their own head when everything about them is designed to be the perfect vehicle for which they're on this world? <coughs> Our feelings, our emotional states or lack of them produce the same kind of results in the brain with no sensory input. That last slide to show the frequency, something is activating that. The brain is designed exactly like an FM receiver. It picks up energy. When you have that aha moment, when you get some kind of, and women are particularly powerful in their female intuition because they're not out, typically they haven't been out in the world hunting and gathering and trying to survive other predators, they have time to sit there and be at peace. Think, they have that connection. There's a reason these witches have led the way far more than men have with regards to spirituality and these pagan faiths. Our feelings, our emotional states, or lack of them produce the same kind of results in the brain with no sensory input. Those brain cells get have to a different frequency. What about those great spiritual aha moments we have all experienced? Where does that frequency originate? Some would tell you, and I will too, that it is a spiritual connection which activates a set of neurons in our brain in exactly the same way. And we do one of two things. We perceive our world as a rosy, happy-go-lucky place, or we begin to see the negative in everything around us. The quality of our life, our ability to stop the ego in its tracks, it's, that choice is absolutely 100% ours to make. I'm telling you all of that, my hope is that you begin to see that we are in receipt of those old original gifts right here and right now. To avail ourselves of what that means, we find a clue in science to suggest that our brains may well still be specifically designed to, inter to interpret wavelengths of energy. What if we are capable of tuning into spiritual frequency as well? It would seem our ancestors placed much stock in the validity of dreams. Where else would these fantastic thoughts originate? Where exactly do your spiritual thoughts originate? What do they sound like? Have you ever thought about them before? They just show up unbidden and unwelcome with no sensory input? How does that happen? What was the trigger which tied two things together so that you might obtain a clearer picture or a much more tangible? Possibility in all of this is that we might access a much larger inventory of tools to handle life than we previously imagined. Faith is a state of mind. If we tune ours to the proper coordinates, who knows where we might end up. I suspect it will be much further along the path than we currently are. Is it really possible that all we need to do is pay attention to our own intuition? It most likely is just as simple as that. As soon as we shed ourselves of the ego, as soon as we undergo that sacrifice, 
the example of which we have seen in all the actions of the gods. Enough people have done so that this faith of Osetru has reemerged on this planet at a time when it is sorely needed. The pain has driven us literally mad to the point where we've got to find something else. In rooms like this all around the country, that is exactly what's happening. We are tuning in to something that we heretofore had no idea existed. Science is showing us that it is. I appreciate everyone's time tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brent. Thank you. Thanks to that frequency. Was that. Uh, I'll have to Google that more. Um, were you saying the one on the far left was.